Hello, everyone. Welcome to Westside. Really glad you're here today. Very glad that those of you who are online with us have chosen to join us also. Well, you only need to experience one Major League Baseball season in Central Illinois to know that we are near the epicenter of a rivalry. Any Cardinals fans here today? Any Cubs fans in the house? Any Astros fans in the house? Okay. <laughs> we never do that, so, you know, I want to throw a bone, right? Well, because of our location, I've noticed that a surprising number of marriages include divided baseball loyalties. I've driven by more than a few houses displaying both cards and Cubs flags and banners. In some cases, a single flag with both team logos on it. Every time the Cards and Cubs play a series, I see social media posts with spouses wearing rival hats and t-shirts and even face paint. Many of us at Westside know and love Bob and Ruth Churchill, who came to church during At The Movies wearing their team's gear, and it was not the same team. And Ruth posted this photo with the caption, Bob and I are discussing the Cardinals and the Cubs. But she put Cardinals in all caps, because you always have to find an edge, right? Now, most intermarriage rivalries are all in good fun. No one is banished to sleep on the couch when the other spouse's team loses a game. I do know a husband who came home from a Cards Cubs game in St. Louis to find his wife asleep in bed wearing her Cubs hat. But fortunately, the marriage is stronger than the rivalry. But there is a brand of rivalry that if unaddressed, if, it, if accepted as normal, is toxic and dangerous, destructive. If you follow the NFL, you know that the Baltimore Ravens released three-time All-Pro Earl Thomas over the summer. Now, Thomas has played in seven Pro Bowls. He's a talented defender. But after an altercation with a teammate last season and another this summer, the Ravens decided that team unity was more important than individual talent. So they cut Thomas from the team. Today is the final week of our series called Above the Fray. And I want to talk to you about a value Jesus prioritized and one that Jesus prayed that you and I would develop in our lives, in our church, in our society. And I want to introduce it by reading from Ephesians chapter 4. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. If you are aware of what is happening in our world, if you're aware at all, you know how badly the followers of Jesus need to model these truths right now. Some folks who've been alive longer than me have told me that this is the time during their lives when they have seen the people of our country most divided. They've never seen it worse, some of them have said. Our name remains United States of America, but we're not living up to it. We're divided over political parties. We're divided over the presidential candidates. We disagree on where we should get our news and what constitutes fake news. We're divided over standing and kneeling during the national anthem, over policing, immigration, how to achieve racial equality. We're divided over how to respond to COVID, over what should be open and what should be closed. The only day this year we've all agreed we should wear masks was yesterday, Halloween. <laughs> but we still couldn't agree on whether or not kids should trick or treat. And there's no doubt Satan loves seeing the people of the same nation work so hard to discredit and destroy each other. And he would love it most of all 
if you and I carried that baggage into the church. When believers divide, it subtracts joy, it adds barriers, it multiplies complaints, and those are the kind of math problems that Satan loves. The first thing I noticed in the verses I read a moment ago from Ephesians 4 is just the tone of Paul's instruction. Tone is so important when we're communicating, especially when we're communicating hard things or potentially difficult or controversial things. And Paul's tone is unifying. It's not divisive. Now, Paul was an apostle appointed by Jesus to lead the church and to instruct and guide the church. He had the authority to demand that the Ephesians treat each other better but Paul wanted to model the attitude that he was encouraging them to adopt. And so did you notice that Paul said, I'm begging you. Doesn't it do something inside you when someone says, look, I'm begging you. Will you just consider this? It just changes us and softens us. And even though we may not be able to agree with what they say or what they ask us to do, it really does make a difference to communicate that way. There was a time when my parenting style and the Nike slogan were exactly the same. Just do it. Do it. But you know, appealing to one's authority too often can actually weaken authority over time. Because it's more effective to convince people than to try to control people. Even if you have the authority, it's better to try to convince people. And there used to be more of that in our national politics. We called it statesmanship, but it's really hard to find statesmanship today. Today, politicians speak almost exclusively to those who already support them. And many of us make a point of getting our news from sources and people who will not challenge the assumptions and the conclusions to which we've already come. So here in Ephesians chapter 4, rather than leaning into his authority, the Apostle Paul is winsome and he's pastoral and he's personal. He wants to redirect them, not rule them. He wants to inspire them, not intimidate them. And I really hope that as I say that, that it reminds you in some way of the way that we try to teach and motivate and guide this church. While there is certainly a time to offer correction and to be very clear and to give warnings, Paul told his ministry student, Titus, to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. Now, maybe you have some personal church history where maybe there were people or teachers who thought if the teaching of God is attractive, then it's not true. But Paul says, no, that's not true. We can teach the truth and call people to the truth in a way that is inviting. Tone is important. It doesn't change the truth, but it's very important. Let me ask you a question. Do you think our politics would benefit from more attempts to reason with people and convince people and fewer attempts to cajole or control people? Did you notice I asked you that instead of telling you that? We live in an era when parties and politicians are battling ferociously for power. And look, I'm not against our system. I'm not against competing ideas. And sometimes we have to get in there and mix it up in order to sort it out. But those of us who support or vote for someone sometimes adopt the unfortunate tone of the person that we're following or supporting. Have you ever heard the term bully pulpit? There was a time when the bully pulpit, which is the visible platform that every public official receives, there was a time when the bully pulpit was more pulpit and less bully. And it would make a difference if we, the people who support and vote for these candidates, expected it to be more that way. The prophet Isaiah was sent to the nation of Israel to give them some warnings, some stern warnings at times. But even Isaiah said to the Israelite people, 
Come now, let us reason together. Let's think about this. You see, noble, wise leaders urge their followers to do what needs to be done. And a noble leader will want people to count the cost, not just win at any cost. If we don't expect our leaders to set the example, then the intensity of these political struggles are going to pull them and us under every time. So we need to call them up. We need to pull them up. We need to say to the people on the same side of the political spectrum that we are on, we can do better than this. We need to critique the tone of our own team and not just the tone of the team we oppose. And remember Paul's challenge. Boy, it's a huge challenge, isn't it? He says, always be humble and gentle. So even if your candidate is proud and aggressive, you be humble and gentle. Even when you think that people are voting foolishly and allowing themselves to be, to be deceived, be humble and gentle. If your candidate or your party wins this time around, will you please be humble and gentle? And if your candidate or party loses this time around, always be humble and gentle. Paul writes in verse 3, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You know why he said every effort? Because it takes everything we've got sometimes to stay united, to stay together. The Greek word in that passage that is translated binding in the New Living Translation, it, re it refers to two things that are held together, not on their own, but by a middle thing. And I really like that image because we don't just come together on our own for our own sake. We are bound together, held together by the Savior we love, by the mission we're on together, by our commitment and desire for unity and peace. And when we don't want that or we think that's really unimportant, then we disappoint the one who wants to bind us together. Let's say you heard that my family, the Lowen family, constantly argues over our disagreements about politics. That every time we have a family meal, every time we're texting one another, every time we're responding to each other on social media, we're taking political shots at each other. Suppose my family operated that way. We don't, but suppose we did. And then I invited you to Thanksgiving dinner. Wouldn't you really look forward to that? Or would you pray, Lord, I think I'd rather have a kidney stone. Could I have a kidney stone <laughs> on Thanksgiving instead? Well, let me ask you, what reasonable person would say, I want to draw closer to God. I want to take a step closer to God. And I want to do it with that community of believers in Jesus that always fights about their political differences. Do you see how destructive that is to the mission that God has given us? So for the remainder of our time together, what I want to do is offer you two things that will make you and us a force for unity rather than division. And while these things begin here, I want you to know they don't stay here because truth is truth everywhere. The first one is to acknowledge that government is accountable to God. Sometimes we roll our eyes at people who suggest that our government is accountable to God. But the Bible does teach that. After Jesus rose from the dead, he made the boldest claim imaginable. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that was not a new concept. A thousand years before Jesus said that, King David wrote in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. We belong to him. But when Jesus rose from the dead, God handed him 
the scepter of authority over everyone and everything. And that's why we sing and say and teach that Jesus is Lord of all because he is Lord of all, including every government in this world. In the passage we're exploring today from Ephesians, Paul expressed the same idea like this in verse 6. There is one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, living through all. And the point of all the alls is that God wants us to know that nothing, absolutely nothing, is outside of his authority. And labeling something or recognizing that something is associated with government does not place it outside God's authority. And that's why God will not agree to stay out of government matters. God never said, Jesus is the head of the church, but you people, the government thing, that's all yours. God walks right past the keep out signs that we figuratively place on government institutions and government values. Look at Romans 13, verse 1. It reads, everyone must submit to governing authorities. For all authority comes from God. He's talking about government authority. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Now, if you're anything like me, question marks start ringing up in your mind when you read those words. Every, every official in authority has been placed there by God. Imagine how difficult those words would have been for the readers of Romans chapter 13 in the first century. Because many of them were living under a Roman, I mean, after all, it's the book of Romans. They're living under a Roman emperor who claimed to be God. So there was no sense of accountability or humility toward God. So how could Paul teach that a ruler like that was selected by God? Well, Paul doesn't say that every government leader is handpicked by God. He says every government official is exercising authority that is dele delegated by God. And that implies that government officials are also accountable to God. Twice in verse 4 of Romans 13, Paul is talking about government officials and he uses a term that we normally use for preachers and missionaries. He writes, the authorities are, say these next two words with me, God's servants, sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So when government officials serve you well, they are doing God's work. When government officials justly punish criminals, they're doing God's work. But if they misuse authority, they must give an account to God. They're not only accountable to us, they're accountable to God. So God doesn't handpick every government official. And we can look back through history and we can know that God did not select murderous tyrants and inept leaders that we always read about in our history books. Even rulers who claim to believe in God are not necessarily handpicked by God. Jesus said some people would falsely claim that they know him, but his response would be, I never knew you. But every government official, from the highest to the lowest, exercises authority that is granted by God and is therefore accountable to God. Now, I see a couple of important applications for you and me in this. The first one is this. Total opposition to any government leader is dangerous spiritually. Whether Trump wins or Biden wins the presidency, whether the majority leader of the Senate ends up being McConnell or Schumer, every believer has an obligation to remember verse 2 of Romans chapter 13. In fact, I want us to read it together. Are you ready? So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Now, please hear me. That doesn't mean that every law is just or that every government decision is right or that government officials should be above scrutiny and evaluation. 
It doesn't mean that you have to personally support every position, every law, every politician. It doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise free speech in a responsible way. It doesn't mean you can't work to replace someone you consider to be a poor choice. After all, that is the system that we've been given. But it does mean that if you oppose the government in a way that undermines God's will, in a way that brings harm to other people, you are accountable to God for that. If the Holy Spirit told people who were living under an oppressive, depraved, murderous Roman emperor to be respectful of that person's God-given authority, how much more would God expect it from you and me within our system? You may have many concerns and criticisms about our system, but you have to admit it is infinitely better than the Roman government under the Roman Empire. The second application of this passage in Romans 13 is that government employees deserve our respect. Now, people who do dishonorable things while serving in government cannot claim to deserve respect. But those who serve faithfully should not be the brunt of our jokes or the collateral damage in our political arguments and maneuvers. Government officials are accountable to God as we discussed, but being God's servant also means that a person is authorized by God. And that means if you and I wrongly dishonor a government worker, then we dishonor God. Look at verse 6 of Romans 13. Pay your taxes too. Now, I'm sure many of you have this verse up on the wall of your homes, your favorite verse, right? Pay your taxes too for these same reasons, for government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. We're so forgetful of that, aren't we? Anyone going to the courthouse tomorrow to vote a day early? When you go, notice God's servants behind the tables, behind the counters, Accountable to God, yes, but authorized by God also. Anybody headed to the DMV soon? Have you already decided to be grouchy when you get there? (laughs) Instead, look at a clerk and say, thank you for the tedious work that you do. Thank you for your patience when people fail to follow the instructions but blame you for it. By the way, broken government systems, and we all know there are some, are almost never the fault of the employees that you and I interact with. It goes much further up the ladder. So don't take out your frustrations about government on the little guy or gal who is working and trying to help you because that doesn't make you insightful about government. It just makes you a jerk. The second way you and I can promote unity is to prioritize we over me. You know, it's interesting that after God created the planet and the animals and one human being, he was only dissatisfied with one thing. Remember what it was? It was the fact that Adam was alone. So God created Eve. And they apparently liked each other because we have long lines and traffic jams. Something must have worked out. (laughs) It's also striking to me that even though the decision to follow Jesus and to be baptized is as personal as it can get, no one can make that journey alone. Someone tells us or teaches us about Jesus. And we don't even baptize ourselves. Someone gets in the water with us and lowers us into the water and raises us up to new life in Christ. And then what the Bible describes after we are baptized is not spend a lot of time in isolation meditating on your face. Some of that, that'd be great. But most of what the Bible prescribes for us is community, togetherness. After Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came in power, 
but not on an individual here and another individual there and another individual somewhere else. The Holy Spirit came on people individually as they were together. Acts 2 begins, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. Now, if you don't recognize that scene, you can read Acts chapter 2 later today. But I'll just say it was dramatic. It was powerful. It was life-changing. And it happened not when they were by themselves, but when they were together. And when an even larger crowd gathered soon after that, thousands believed and were baptized. Listen, let me talk a little bit about the here and now. If it becomes obvious that our church needs to go online only again for a season in order to keep people safe, we will do that. Because it's getting dicey, we all know it, and we're not oblivious to it here. But since there hasn't been a transmission of the virus in our Sunday gatherings, and since God works in greater ways when we are together, then we're going to do our best to continue meeting. Because the Christian faith is not a me faith. If it was, it wouldn't matter if you just watched some other time during the week. I mean, it's even better for those who are joining us right now online. There's something better about knowing that there are hundreds and hundreds of other people joining you at this moment. That is at least, in some sense, a way for us to be together. And one of the best things about community is the last five letters. What word do those last five letters spell? Unity. You see, it's in community that we learn how to be gracious and unselfish and to produce unity by doing so. It's in community that we learn that even a flawless conviction can be expressed in a flawed way. Have you ever been right about your position, but really wrong about your disposition? In other words, you might believe the right things, but you might carry those beliefs in wrong ways, or you might apply those true things in ways that are actually inaccurate or incorrect. You've heard me say this before. I grew up in a great church, and I'm really thankful for it. I hear some people my age just dogging their home churches, childhood churches. That is not me. My childhood church introduced me to Jesus and to the kind of life that I've lived. I could not be more grateful for what it gave me. But it was a small city church where the only real diversity was generational diversity and financial diversity. And other than that, we were all pretty similar. Most of us grew up in that region. Nearly all of us had the same skin tone. I suspect that the vast majority of us had the same political and social convictions. I know there were a few exceptions, but probably not many. Our church, Westside, is not as diverse as a church in a larger city, but it is increasingly diverse. And as Sunday morning goes by, it becomes even more obvious. In my time here, we have had Westsiders who were born on five continents and born in dozens of countries. We have welcomed wealthy folks and folks who didn't know where the next meal was coming from and people everywhere in between socioeconomically. We have welcomed Republicans and Democrats and Libertarians and Independents, and we've asked them all not to advertise it. And like any church, most of the folks we reach are from our neighborhood. But if you saw a map of where Westsiders live, I think you'd be surprised by how many people drive from out of town to be here and how many people drive from the other side of town to be here. And if you stood in our concourse throughout an entire Sunday morning, either before COVID or after COVID, you would see a lot of skin tones other than white. Not enough, but more than a few. And you probably don't realize how diverse we are in terms of spiritual background. Westsiders include people 
who were or who still consider themselves to be Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witnesses, atheists, agnostics, Buddhists, Hindu, and some who admitted that they don't even know what label to choose or if there is one. Now, look, we cannot do what all those folks want us to do exactly the way they want us to do it. And we cannot say what every single one of those people would want us to say exactly the way they would want us to say it. And honestly, we shouldn't try. That's not why we're here. But we can connect everyone, no matter where they're from or where they are, we can connect everyone to Jesus and his mission. And we can worship together in humble unity. We can serve together in unity. We can bind ourselves together because Jesus desires it and he helps it happen and he expects it of us. And look, while it may be easier to be part of a church where everyone looks like you, and where everyone thinks like you and has the same social and political values that you have, I just want to say it's better to be part of a church where unity is not automatic or where it's not merely circumstantial. Because in a diverse church, unity is an ongoing choice. And there are times when it's a difficult choice. And what's true for a church is also true for our country. We have to choose to stick together even though we will not always get what we want. Even though we will be disturbed by some of what we hear other people or potential leaders saying. Even when we know that our laws or events are not right. Our culture desperately needs us to carry these attitudes and behaviors and this humility that makes the church work, our culture needs us to carry it into the world. We can't just leave it here. We have unity here because we actually restrain some of our opinions. We don't express every thought that we have. And we don't use anger and sarcasm to communicate with people. And our world beyond this church needs that kind of spirit and behavior and those kinds of words also. We have unity in this church because we know that God wants it, God expects it, and because we know that if we let go of unity, it would be one of the greatest possible tragedies. And our country needs us to step out of this place and to think the same way about our culture and our nation. Some of you know Rick Warren said, people ask me if I'm left wing or right wing, but I'm concerned about the whole bird. <laughs> and as God's people, we have to be concerned about the whole bird, not just the people who vote like we do and come to the conclusions that we do. And we have to participate in this free election process, which does include debate and tension. We have to find a way to participate in a way that doesn't violate the values that we know that God is counting on us to display and the example that he wants us to be to others. It's not just our political team that matters. It's the whole bird. So let's, as Paul put it, Make every effort. And when it feels like effort, let's keep making every effort to remain united.